Good morning, Trinity United Methodist Church. So glad that you chose to join with us today in worship for those who are members and those who are not members. And no matter where you are scattered about, uh, whether you're on your sofa or dining room table or, or wherever, we are happy that you are choosing to join with us online uh, for our worship together and hope that this is a meaningful time for you. Let me make a couple announcements right quick. Um, we are continuing through August at least while the COVID incident rate is high with our outdoor drive-in worship as well. So you can join us either in the parking lot or online um, and we will monitor that week by week as we go forward. Um, we have, however, set a few dates that I want to let you know about. One is on August the 16th, we will be giving out our children's Bibles. Um, and the rain date for that, if we're rained out on the 16th, will go to the next week on August the 23rd. We've also set a date for our blessing in the backpacks. That will be Sunday evening at 6.30 on August the 30th. And more details will be coming out about that. And the rain date for that is going to be pushed to the Wednesday night, September 2nd, if needed. Um, again, at 6.30 in the evening. So although uh, the pandemic is happening, uh, we are trying to keep everybody as safe as possible, but continuing to minister in every way possible. And we know that this year, the blessing of the backpacks is even more important than ever. So if you are a teacher, administrator, all our students, we certainly want you to come and participate in that again on August the 30th. I think that's all my announcements. <laughs> um, I'll make one more, one more addition. And that is that we will be planning, I mentioned this once before, uh, porch patio sessions for me to get to know folks. They will start in September. So uh, we are uh, looking at dates and you'll be finding out more information in the coming weeks about how you can join in one of those. And I will say this as well, I got moved this past week so i am sore and i am hurting but i am happy to be in anderson um, and it is so nice to be just a minute drive from the church so uh that's great anyway uh thank you for joining us i hope that this time is a, is a meaningful time of worship for you today Okay, so we have been looking at our creeds and affirmations of faith that are found in the back of the United Methodist Hymnal. We looked at the two creeds, the Nicene Creed and Apostles' Creed. And now we've been looking at the affirmations of faith. Last week we looked at the one from the United Church of Canada, which you learned, I hope, uh, that that's in the Methodist family from 1925. This week, if you look on page 884, number 884 in the United Methodist Hymnal, we have a statement of faith of the Korean Methodist Church. Now, in the 1800s, Methodists uh, sent missionaries all over the globe, um, and they were quite successful. So Ohio Wesleyan College was the uh, missionary school that all missionaries went through and they dispersed out throughout the globe. Uh, we started in Korea in the 1800s, the Methodist Church did. Now what happened, same thing sort of as the United Church of Canada um, in the 20s, a lot of United or a lot of Methodist churches in the 20s and 30s became autonomous. So that's what happened to the Korean Methodist Church it's part of the World Methodist Council, but it's not United Methodist. It is Korean Methodist. And they formed Independent Autonomous Church in 1930. Of course, keep in mind about what's going on in America. 1929 started the Great Depression. And we didn't have the financial resources to continue supporting the churches around the globe like we had before. 
So a lot of those churches became autonomous during that time. This creed, or this affirmation of faith, excuse me, came from 1930, 1931. mainly written by one particular bishop, but there were other people in on it as well. Um, So this was supposed to be um, Christian, Methodist, and Korean. So to unite them together as their new autonomous church. Um, Let's hear this statement. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, Father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God, as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Have you been walking the same old road for miles and miles? You've been hearing the same old voice to the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. You got pain, he's a pain taker. You feel long. He's a way maker. You need freedom, saving. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chain. He's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day, dead or night. We've all found ourselves worn out. Same old fire. We all run to things we know just ain't right. And there's a better life. There's a better life. And you got pain. He's a pain taker. You feel long. He's a way man. Freedom saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You got chain, he's a chain breaker. If you believe it, if you receive it, you can feel it. Somebody testify. believe it you receive it you can feel it somebody testify you believe it you receive it you can feel it somebody testify you got pain he's a pain taker He's a way maker. You need freedom, saving. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chains. He's a chain.
chain breaking. You need freedom, saving. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chain. He's a chain breaker. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, please bow with me in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you for Trinity uh, here in Anderson, but we also thank you for your church universal, the body of Christ that is impacting our world as we speak. Um, as we deal with this pandemic, we pray that you would give us the strength, uh, the courage uh, to be that bright light and uh, so much darkness right now. Uh, we pray for the people that are most affected by COVID, the frontline workers, those with family members, uh, people struggling from job losses. We just pray that you would be with us um, as we deal with the repercussions of what all is going on. Uh, while we cannot meet physically together, uh, we thank you that we have this outlet, uh, this technology uh, that we can gather together in this virtual space. We thank you in your infinite wisdom for providing that for us because we know that no matter where we are, that you are with us and you join um, in our worship time together. Now as we continue to praise you and bless you, Lord, uh, we recite the prayer that you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So today we begin a new series um, in worship for the month of August. We're using our lectionary texts for this series. Uh, lectionary, by the way, if you don't know, this Latin word that simply means a set of readings. So within the lectionary, there's always an Old Testament, a Psalm, a Gospel, and a New Testament reading. And there's a three-year cycle, year A, year B, year C. And if you go through that three-year cycle, then you're going to read 80 to 85% of the Bible every three years um, and hear it in worship. So that's what we're using for this, um, for this series. And we're mainly going to be guided by the gospel according to Matthew. At times, bringing in the epistle lesson um, to the Romans. Questions for us to think about during this series as we dig down into the core of what it means to live out our faith. How do we live into these miraculous moments in Jesus' life? in our world today. Are we called to be miracle workers too? Or is there something else going on? What if we are asking the wrong question about the statements and actions of Jesus? What if it isn't supposed to be how, but perhaps it's supposed to be a why? What is our motivation today to live as followers of Jesus? Our theme for this month is simple. It is because God. So let's begin now by looking at our lectionary text from Matthew's Gospel. Today's reading is going to be read by one of our soon-to-be college students, Brendan Schubert who will be an incoming first year student at Anderson University. Take it away, Brendan. Today our word comes from Matthew. It is Matthew, 13, Matthew 14, 13 through 21. Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. J Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. Give them something to eat. 
We only have we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to the heaven, he gave thanks, broke the loaves, and then he set, gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Brendan. So, three mice go to heaven. Yep, I'm going to start that way. Three mice go to heaven, and they meet St. Peter at the gate. St. Peter says, Oh, mice, since you are God's precious creatures, I am authorized to give each of you a wish. So one mouse speaks up for the whole group and says, you know, all our lives we've lived in this building with hardwood floors and we've always wanted a pair of roller skates so we could skate around. So St. Peter says, so it may be so. And off they go into heaven with their own pair of roller skates. And then a cat dies. And the cat goes to heaven and St. Peter again says, Ah, cat, you are God's precious creation. And before you enter, I grant you one wish. And the cat replies, Well, I've lived in a building with these hardwood floors where it was always very uncomfortable to sleep. Could I have a nice big satin pillow? So it shall be, St. Peter says. And the cat goes into heaven with its new pillow. A few days later, Jesus happens upon the cat and asks him, and how are you enjoying the heavenly kingdom? And the cat replies, oh, it is just wonderful. The mansion is beautiful. My room is immaculate. The pillow is just beyond luxurious. But my favorite part about heaven has to be the meals on wheels that you keep sending me. You know, it's hard to do a joke uh, online because I have no idea about your response you know I hope you're laughing but if you're not you know I'll try better next time anyway today we explore the familiar story of the feeding of the 5,000 now did you know that this is the only one of Jesus's miracles that is recounted in all four Gospels Besides being here in Matthew chapter 14, it appears in Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9, John chapter 6. And then there's also an additional account of Jesus feeding the 4,000 in Matthew chapter 15. So really it's, it's a story told five times in four Gospels in slight variation. This should tell us something about its importance. The repetition of this story is a clue that it represents something that was very, very important to the early church, and they viewed it as being crucial to the Christian story. Many times, or most times, when miracles occur in Scripture, the stories are not really about the miracles themselves. A miracle happens to take place, but the miracles point us towards something else. And almost always when food appears in scriptures, which happens a whole lot, not just in my sermons, by the way, but food points us towards something deeper in meaning, something about God's abundance or something perhaps about 
our sustenance. So the disciples come to Jesus and they say, this is a deserted place. Send the crowds away. And Jesus replies, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And the you is really emphasized in the Greek text. It's like capitalized. Um, Jesus is commanding the disciples to feed my sheep. To be moved with compassion as Jesus is so that they actually do something about it. You give them something to eat. It was October 1st through the 5th, 2015. We lived in Columbia at the time of the so-called South Carolina thousand year flood event. Do you remember this event? For us in Columbia, it washed out over 300 roads and bridges collapsed or, or were washed away. It took them more than three years to repair them all. We had 28 inches of rain in less than 48 hours. And levees were breached, dams broke, power was out all over the city. Some places for more than a week, week and a half, almost two weeks before they restored power. Within the midst of this disaster, Miracles took place. One thing was no looting ever occurred in Columbia. Crime actually went down during that time. Neighbors got outside and helped other neighbors. The restaurant industry, of course, was hit hard as it's being hit hard now by the pandemic. But a few managed to stay open. Among them was Lizard's Thicket. You've probably heard of it. They have 14 restaurants in Columbia and 12 of them managed to stay open. Two of them suffered so much damage that they had to close. Those 12 restaurants gave out hundreds of free meals a day to first responders, to the National Guard, to displaced residents. When other restaurants and businesses heard what they were doing, they began sending their own food and their own water to help them. The CEO of Lizard's Thicket at the time, Bobby Williams, called Governor Haley and Mayor Benjamin and told them to give out his personal cell number to anyone or to send anyone to him that was hungry. Mr. Williams said, and this is a quote, anyone who needs food, I'll feed them. You give them something to eat. That is the command that Jesus gives to his disciples. Matthew's account has the disciples responding in a very matter of fact kind of way to Jesus' command. They simply give a factual account of their limited provisions. The accounts, however, in the other gospels, in Mark and Luke and John, emphasize in various ways a sarcastic skepticism, I'll say, of the disciples. In Mark chapter 6, verse 37, they say, are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? In Luke 9, 13, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. In John chapter 6, verse 7, they say, well, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to even get a little. Here in Matthew, however, they simply report we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. To which Jesus responds, bring them here to me. 
I believe this story occurs five times in the four Gospels because we need to hear it over and over and over again. And future generations will need to hear it as well. For we stand in the shoes of the disciples in Matthew's account. We are to obey Jesus' daring and radical and ridiculous command. You give them something to eat. Think about it. Maybe, maybe Jesus was just hoping that they, that we, might realize and know our limitations, our weaknesses, or how much we need God. On the other hand, maybe Jesus was trying to get them to see that their resources, allied with the power of God, was more than they could ever have dreamed about. Their resources, when combined and given to God, are more than enough. Maybe Jesus was trying to change the attitude that says, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, we, we do tend to look at what we don't have rather than what we do have. I know that I can be guilty of that at times. We tend to feel overwhelmed by the problems that we face rather than being willing to start with what might seem like inadequate resources and see what God can do with what we bring. Can we hear Jesus saying to us, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Over and over again in life, we're surrounded by such human need. And we think that we do not have the resources in our own wisdom, our own wealth or strength or abilities to meet the need. And with the disciples, we often say, well, this is a deserted place. We, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. We can't possibly do that. And then we hear Jesus say, bring them here to me. And he takes them and he blesses them and he breaks them and he gives them and he asks us to do the same to take, eat, and remember. And our resources combined with God's power is more than enough. And that God's provision is not just a relic of the past, but it's a reality that undergirds our future with hope. Take, eat, and remember. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.
I hope you've gathered your bread and your cup, your fruit of the vine, we'll say, as we come to this table. Christ invites all to this table, for it's not a United Methodist table, it's the Lord's table. And we are invited to take, eat, and remember. And we remember when Jesus was with the 5,000 or the 4,000 or on the night before he met with death when he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said take and eat this is my body given for you when you eat this remember me and when the supper was over Jesus took the cup and he passed it around to each and every one of his disciples. And he said, take and drink. This is my love, my life, my blood, poured out and given for you for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink this, remember me. And so we remember these mighty acts of Jesus Christ as we offer ourselves as living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the, the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So let us pray together. God, pour out your spirit on us gathered 
and scattered and on these gifts of bread and cup make them truly be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your great love O God may we be in ministry with you and with one another and to all the world until you come again and we feast at your heavenly banquet. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of life given for you. The cup of salvation, cup of grace, cup of love, overflowing for you. Take, eat, and remember. For me, communion is a is a call. It's not just a remembrance. A remembrance of what Jesus did what God has done for us but it's also a call upon our lives to be the body of Christ to be the hands and feet you are what you eat from your head down to your feet so to be that for others and it also does a third thing and that is it unites us as brothers and sisters of Christ into the one body the one loaf each piece and although we are celebrating together but yet scattered, I still believe that is true. As we take, we are united as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I am thankful for that. So, may you not just take it into, into your bellies, but may you take it into your head and into your heart so that it transform your life into who Christ is calling you to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Trinity Church, I hope that this was a meaningful time of worship for you. And I pray that you have a healthy week ahead and that Christ abides in you and with you and directs your path throughout the week until we come together again. May the love and joy and peace and hope of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.